Hello family members. Hope you're having a lovely day today. I'm having a muscle cramp walking around with a cane kind of day myself, but you know, it is what it is. <laughs> I want to talk to you today about something that just I find interesting, I guess is, is the way to put it. And, uh, and it's the way that that a lot of people seem to commonly misunderstand the word triggered, as well as just mental health in general, let's be honest. So, um, I, I, there's a video by ContraPoint about uh, JK Rowling being on a podcast that was then reacted to by some other guy on his podcast and she plays the clip of the guy talking about how he you know basically in order to dismiss or discredit the left he says that he believes that there are there's a a, a lot of of uh, frankly mental illness or frank mental illness in in the left and in activist circles uh generally and you know, the truth of the matter is, yeah, duh, wow. Uh, people who are mentally ill are marginalized and marginalized people are forced to be activists because society tries to discredit us and pretend like we don't exist and uh, erase us and not serve us, okay? Like, that's not a condemnation of activists. That's a description of how many people become activists because they are mentally ill and they have to deal with a system that frankly just wishes that they'd never been born because they're inconvenient. Any kind of disabled person is treated this way by our society. Like surely it would just be a lot nicer if we didn't have to deal with you, if you would just go away. And so, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of us who are activists. There are a lot of us on the left because people who are mentally ill are oppressed, but like, yeah, but that's the thing. When I talk about people who have mental illness, I'm talking about people who have a medical condition that affects their mental health, their emotional health, their cognitive health, things like that. You know, it could be depression or anxiety or flashbacks or night terrors, any number of things, right? Uh, mania, you know, people people often discount that as as a part of it. And the problem is that I'm talking about that, and people who disparage people over their mental health are talking about mental health as as an insult. You know, it, it's something that I've been really working on myself because it's hard. Our language includes words that have, they're, they're rooted in uh, marginalized communities that are then repurposed to be used as broad insults. Uh, for example, the R slur. Um, you know, I've been seeing a lot of ads about that lately, you know. Uh, mm -mm, no. You know, you don't say that because the problem is people, it doesn't matter what terminology we use for people with intellectual disabilities. Whatever that common ter terminology is, society has just historically turned that into a broad insult. Imbecile, moron, handicapped, arsler, on and on and on. Dumb is, is a word that originally meant unable to speak and that's been broadly changed into just a broad insult and people don't think about that and so 
what people are talking about when they talk about mental illnesses, they're talking about in their head, they're talking about somebody who is lesser, who is unworthy of consideration, who you can discount because they're just, they're just crazy. And so like, I've tried really hard the last few years to remove the word crazy from my vocabulary in any context because the inclination is to use it as like a description for something being absurd or unbelievable or, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, just bad. It's just, a, it's used in a lot of negative ways. And what that's supposed to mean is somebody who is mentally ill, right? And so we need to decouple this automatic assumption that mental illness equals morally bad person or lesser person or somebody who you can discount because they don't know what they're talking about or their opinions or thoughts are unimportant. Just because somebody is mentally ill does not mean that they are unable to speak intelligently on any given topic, you know? I, I, I struggled with chronic depression my entire life, anxiety, I've been diagnosed with ADD. I have been going, undergoing a very severe mental health crisis since I developed my chronic illness and my disability and my inability to work or functionally leave the house and enjoy myself, eat and enjoy myself. It, it's, it, I was already working so hard to mask the mental health issues that I already had that when this came along and just knocked the wind out of my sails, it was impossible for me to ignore my, the, the struggles I was having with my mental health. It was no longer something I can function with. It was no longer something I could mask, even for myself. <sighs> Which is, uh, it's a frustrating thing. You, know, you spend all your life, you know, as a, as a, a geriatric millennial, an early 80s baby, as I was, um, we grew up in a society that told you that if you were neurospicy, that you had to hide it in order to be an acceptable person, a worthwhile person or part of society. And so I fought for decades to kind of cobble together a way of coping with the way that other people expected me to behave. And figuring out how to work within their system and never really thinking that I needed to try to change it instead just trying to figure out how to I, I could never change myself that's just a, an essential part of my being I'm very like I am who I am you know get over it but I had to figure out how I could survive in a system that didn't want me to be who I was. And so I would learn how to mask in certain situations or uh, use things that society found acceptable about my differences where I could and keep other things very private. And once I kind of got knocked down once I stumbled. I started having extremely difficult time with, with things triggering me. I would see things that would be so upsetting to me, I'd be left sobbing. And, um, and I realized that I had I had 
to stop subjecting myself to some of these things that, that could trigger this. <clears throat> now, what it is that actually does trigger me changes uh, over time. Um, when it first started, it was like, it was during COVID, really. You know, I, I hadn't really started getting sick, sick yet. But, you know, uh, we were knocked down and, and isolated. And I, I noticed that that first summer uh, before COVID, I had to be very careful about what sort of politics, current events type content I took in because it would overwhelm me and upset me and, and I'd break down and I couldn't function. Like I would literally not be able to do anything other than just sit in a chair and either cry or just sit there, literally nothing, not playing on my phone, not doing anything. And that is so unlikely to me. I'm like, I have ADD. I'm usually doing two or three things at once. Like I'm, I literally have a YouTube video on mute on the TV <laughs> that I'm kind of like not watching, but I'm not not watching it while I make a YouTube video because I can't, uh, yeah, I can't not multitask. I just can't. I can't. So anyway, um, yeah, it was, it was just breaking me down. And so I had to figure out what it was that was triggering me and avoid it. And anything that helped me figure out if something that I was going to potentially consume had some topic or subject matter that was going to trigger me was a godsend because I wasn't going to get blindsided out in nowhere with something that was going to make it impossible for, for me to, to continue watching what I was watching or doing anything else. And after, after I got disabled, what it was that triggered me changed, but it's been fairly consistently uh, anti-trans bigotry, which is an interesting thing, you know, because I'm cis and I, I do have some trans friends, but it's not like I have like, you know, like a trans partner or trans sibling or something like that that makes it like extremely personal. But for some reason, it's just very upsetting for me. Of course, uh, anti-queer bigotry uh, definitely does that a lot. Um, initially, anything related to police brutality, because again, you know, the first times I started having this issue was in that summer of 2020. I mean, like, I think probably right now, I, I still can't watch anything. I cannot watch anything about Trayvon Martin. It is so upsetting to me because, you know, literally the next town south from me is where he was murdered, where that poor child lived and died, where that murderer got away with taking the life of a child because the laws here in Florida are just disgustingly stacked in favor of the powerful and uh, stacked in against the marginalized and, and the victims of, of our society's failures. So, uh, well, of course, you know, I mean, my brother's wife is black. My uh, niece, nephew, or my nieces and nephew are, are mixed race. I have a second family from Zimbabwe. And so I have also, you know, sort of nieces and nephews that are, are mixed there. I mean, like, I mean, my, my, my neighbor across the street's from Uganda, and she's got mixed race kids. Like, to me, you know, the, that is as personal as I, you know, as I would think. You know, for me, like, racism is a very personal thing. When I see things about Trayvon Martin, I'm not just seeing Trayvon Martin, I'm seeing my nephew, Aiden, because he's autistic. 
young mixed race autistic boy. This is scary. You know, it's terrifying to think about him growing up and having trouble communicating and having to deal with law enforcement. That's, uh, that doesn't surprise me that that triggers me, but it does surprise me that I find, you know, the way that, that trans people are treated so triggering. You know, I find things like uh, uh, fat, fat phobic content pretty triggering for probably pretty obvious <laughs> reasons, you know. And, and there's this idea that a trigger is a weakness. But it's not a weakness. It's just a thing. It's just the way that, that my brain works. Because my, you know, life is extremely stressful. I'm in pain constantly. And that messes with your head. And so a, a trigger to me is a tool. Knowing that hey, here's this thing that if I'm feeling particularly fragile, if I avoid that, that's going to help me not break down. That's a great tool for me to have. And it's just so hilarious how people, how resentful people are of trigger, trigger warnings. Like, it just cracks me up. Like, it literally is triggering them in the way that they mean it. They tr think trigger means that they find something like obnoxious or offensive. And that's not what triggered means in the original sense. The original sense is that it's something that will psychologically trigger you because of mental you know, illness or trauma that you have, you know? <laughs> So the, uh, that's, of course, conservative projection. Uh, example number 567,434, you know, right? Like, that <laughs> it's so ridiculous how people who don't understand something or vaguely understand something assign a meaning to it and then react very negatively to the meaning that they assigned. A prime example of this is a Matt Walsh clip that I saw where he admits right at the top that he does not know what a drag mother is but then gets extremely offended and upset by the existence of drag moms based on what he thinks that they are. <laughs> He thinks that drag moms are like literally going out and finding children to raise up and recruiting them. And it's like a drag mom is someone who takes on a mentorship role with generally an adult drag queen who has sought out that membership. It's the exact opposite of what they think. Instead of a drag mom recruiting her drag children, drag children usually seek out the mentorship of someone and then are honored to earn the title of a drag child of a particular drag mom. Like, a good drag queen, having her as your drag mom is like, amazing you know it's like getting an internship at the best business that you could ever work at or something if that's your the business you want to be in drag then a, having a drag mom who will mentor you is like a plus 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 so what he thought a drag queen was based on his misunderstanding he then con condemns without understanding what it actually is and you see that all over the place in conservative thinking. There's that other famous clip of some guy complaining about uh, furries in the classroom. And he says, furries, if you don't know what furries are, it's where school children, they meow and they bark. And they <laughs> use litter boxes and blah, blah, blah. 
honey, furries have nothing to do with children. It's a, a kink. That's something that's very adult only behavior. It is definitely not something that is going on in schools, nor should it be, because that's not the point of it. That would be like saying we shouldn't have dominatrixes in the classroom. Yes, I agree. A person who is a dominatrix, if she goes in the classroom, none of her accoutrement of her dominatrix hood should come with her. It should be normal professional dress, okay? And no talk of that because that's not appropriate around kids. Yes, you're right. It's not appropriate around kids, but no one's trying to do that around kids. That's not the point at all, okay? <laughs> like... It's just, well, you see it in, in the comment section on things, like over and over again. If you look through TikTok or Reels or whatever, you'll see that the top comments on a lot of videos are people who don't understand what they're seeing and then mistakenly assume that something bad or wrong is going on based on their lack of understanding. And, you know, they'll see... A mom, uh, this was one I saw fairly recently, and it was pretty gross. Uh, an in, indigenous um, uh, American mother using um, you know, traditional means for cradling her child. And in the comments, just comment after comment of people saying, that's not safe, that's not right. Her people have been doing that for thousands of years. I think she knows what she's doing better than you do. Okay? Like, you don't understand it, and so it must be bad and wrong. That's conservatism. American's conservatism in, like, a nutshell. And it drives me crazy because... I'm sick and tired of people trying to shame me for being depressed, for being fat, for being aromantic, for being a egosexual, for being ADD, for being loud or uh, effusive or verbose or all of the things that I am essentially in my own being that cannot be changed to make you more comfortable, I'm just sick and tired of constantly being shamed for that. And it doesn't work. I don't feel ashamed of who I am, but it does get exhausting to see. And I know that though other people's condemnation isn't necessarily going to knock me down, that doesn't mean that other people who are positioned similarly to me are not going to be completely knocked off balance by it. And so it's important for me to fight back against it as a broad concept because the more and more we make bigotry a socially unacceptable thing, the better for all society. Because if you think that it's not possible that you could become a part of a marginalized community, then you're wrong. Because almost every single family in this country, a, 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 barring a very small population, most of this country, are just a few financial crises away from becoming homeless. You know, become, being assigned to the class of homeless. You know, just because they lost their housing, not necessarily because of anything that they did wrong. Or if you think it's not possible you could ever become disabled, then you must never ride in a car. Because people will get and motor vehicle accidents all the time that cause them to be disabled. And again, not necessarily through any fault of their own. People get sick. You know, I had cancer, you know. <laughs> I was in my late 30s and I got uh, cancer. 
did you think that I expected that to happen? I mean, I was lucky that I had a type of cancer that is treatable, that I was cured, which I think it's really funny that people think that there's no cure for cancer, but because some kinds of cancers do have cures, but others don't. And it's not like cancer is one thing, but that's a whole other, you know, rant. <laughs> but seriously, if you think that you don't need to care about how society treats marginalized people because you're not part of a marginalized group, then you're really missing important context here because you could very well be part, become part of a marginalized group at any time. People you love could become marginalized at any time. You know, uh, you may not think it's possible for you to have a queer child, but you could. You may not think it's possible for you to have a disabled child, but you could. You may not think that you're ever going to have people from other races marry into your family, but they could. You may think there's a lot of reasons why you will always be separated from the marginalized groups that you don't care about, like mentally ill people or disabled people or whatever. But the line between you and them is a permeable line. Your place in society can change. And so if you're not advocating for a society that works for all of us, at some point, you will feel the consequences of that. Very few people in our society are so insulated from things that they couldn't at some point and won't at some point feel the consequences of their passivity in the name of injustice. So, yes, things trigger me. Yes, I'm very grateful when there are trigger warnings. Yes, triggered is a legitimate thing and it is not synonymous with just being offended or annoyed by something. And I'm not ashamed of who I am and I'm not going to be. And uh, um, feel free to try. I don't know why you'd waste your time on that. Surely you have better things to do. I want you to have better things to do. I want you to invest in yourself. I want you to make you and your family happy. I want you to be happy. Even if you don't want me to be happy, I want you to be happy. I hope that's not something that's different between you and me. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, I'm obviously going through a manic phase. I have no idea if I'm going to be making daily videos for the next week or if this will be the last one that I make for a while. And that's because I struggle with neurodiversity and mental illness. And that doesn't make me less important and it doesn't make my opinions less important so bless you if you took the time to listen to this and uh to all the people who didn't <laughs> still bless you why not you know other people's happiness doesn't make me less happy other people's comfort doesn't make me less comfortable so i wish you happiness and comfort I love you little nieces and nephews and nipplings out there. <laughs> even if you're not mixed race, even though a lot of my nieces and nephews and nipplings are. <laughs> uh, gotta love uh, America. I do, I do. That's my hope. I hope that we can live up to our promise someday. That's why I keep trying to push for that because I think it's possible. So I hope you have a nice day. Take care of the people and animals you love. Bye.